Hello, Brindley, can you hear me? Yes, I can, one second. Good. How's the semester been so far? Pretty good. Good, hanging in there, staying afloat? Yeah. <laughs> Don't drown, okay? Just keep it going. <laughs> I will, I will. I'll be right back, I need to grab my calculator. No, take your time. <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, let me know when you're ready. Hi, Rob. Hey, how are you today? Good. How's it going? Good. Good, good, good. Are we ready to start getting into this? Yes, definitely. Excited to get the semester finally finished. <laughs> Very much so. I know, I know. It's okay, you, you got this. It's a matter of time and it's all done. And you'll be like, yes, I did it. Yep, can't wait. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, Brinley, are you back with your calculator? Yes, I just got back. Good. So I'll go ahead and start. Sometimes we usually don't get much people. They just wait for the video or they are busy at this time. So by the time I finish, I'm still gonna upload the video immediately on Canvas. So those who missed can um, watch the review. <clears throat> so the good thing about you being here is you can ask me questions after the clarification and I can explain better and you know clarify more on the concept. So this is a practice exam three. And the first question says, complete the following statement. When the current in an oscillating LC circuit is zero, then we say the correct answer is B, the energy in the electric field is maximum. So I'm gonna tell you why I wrote some statements. So just easy to see here. So an LC circuit can conserve electrical energy when it oscillates at its natural resonance frequency. So the capacitor will store energy in electrical field between its plate based on the voltage it receives, but the inductor will accumulate energy in the magnetic field depending on the current B. So this is what's going on. We can conserve electrical energy inside the capacitor. We can conserve um, magnetic energy uh, or uh, <clears throat> magnetic field energy inside the inductor. So the, the, the charge flow is a cosine function like this. So the current is charged the QDT to be a sine function. And this is how they are related. So the cosine function for the charge goes like that. And the charges are stored in the capacitor that stores electrical energy. And then the uh, current goes like this. So when the current is zero, what happens? Look at every point that the current goes to zero, the charge is maximum, you see? When the current is zero, your charge is maximum. And what does that tell you? When your charge is maximum, it means you have a lot of charge in the capacitor. Charge has nothing to do with the inductor. So then the electrical field becomes maximum. The energy in the electrical field becomes maximum. And because current is determined, the electrical field, the energy in the magnetic field in the inductor is determined by current. When current is zero, there will be no energy in stored in the magnetic field. So does that make sense? So then when current is a maximum, the charge is zero? Yes, when current is at maximum, then you have all the energy going to the magnetic field in the inductor. There'll be zero uh, field uh, energy in the capacitor at this point. Does that make sense? It will be the opposite of what we are getting right now. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, next problem. An AC generator supplies an RMS, not peak voltage of 180 volt. At the 60 at 60 hertz frequency, the generator is connected in series with a 0.5 Henry inductor, a six 
microfarad capacitor and a 300 ohm resistor. What is the capacitive reactance? So capacitive reactance is just one over two pi FC. So we don't care about the inductor, the resistor, the voltage. We just, uh, those are just given to us and we're gonna use them probably in the next problem, but um, the capacitive reactance is just one over two pi FC, one over two pi times the frequency times the capacitance converting to SI units times 10 to the power minus six. And uh, that gives us that. <clears throat> then number three is the same problem, but you're asked to find the phase angle for this circuit. And phase angle is written as tangent of theta equals the inductive reactance minus capacitive reactance over the resistance. So we've already gotten the capacitive reactance, one over two pi FC as 440. So the inductive reactance XL is two pi FL. So we calculate that two pi times frequency times 0 0.5 Henry is the inductance. Then minus capacitive reactance all over resistance 300 ohms. So this minus that over that, we get this, we get a negative number. So the tangent inverse of that negative number gives us a negative angle of minus 40 degrees. Does this make sense? Yeah. Number four, which, of the, which one of the following statements concerning electromagnetic waves is false? Uh, electromagnetic waves carry energy, that's true. X-rays have longer wavelengths than radio waves, that's not true. Um, X-rays have higher frequency than radio waves and higher frequencies means shorter wavelengths. So B is definitely an incorrect one. And you can also see that all the rest are true uh, apart from B. So which one of the statements is false is that X-ray have longer wavelength than radio waves, that's false. And we're gonna have a similar problem here that clarifies it. Know the different types of electromagnetic radiation, X-rays, visible light, radio waves, gamma rays, infrared, so they are numbered. And it says, which list correctly ranks the electromagnetic waves in order of increasing frequency? So we start from short frequency radio waves to the highest frequency, which is gamma rays. So the way to remember it is what I used to remember back in high school called Revox G. Radio waves, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, X-ray gamma rays, Revox G gives an easy way for you to remember radio waves is the shorter wavelength, I mean, the longer wavelength all the way to the shortest wavelength and the shorter frequency all the way to the highest frequency. So in order of increasing frequency from the short frequency, we're gonna start arranging from radio waves. Radio waves have the uh, shortest frequency and then we increase to gamma rays, Revox G. So it becomes two, five, four, six, one, three in the order of Revox G. Radio waves, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, X-ray and gamma rays. Does that make sense? Yep. Good. Hi, Emily. We'll go to the next problem, number six. A cellular telephone transmits electromagnetic waves at a frequency of this. What is the wavelength of this wave? So any electromagnetic waves, one thing they might not tell you is the speed. All electromagnetic waves propagate with the same speed, which is the speed of light, C. So we're going to use the speed of light as the speed, even if we are not told, and then we have the frequency. So we can use speed is frequency times lambda to find lambda as speed over frequency. So the speed will be speed of light divided by the frequency we are given. 835 megahertz. Mega is times 10 to the 6. We convert to SI units, then we divide speed of light by this frequency times 10 to the 6, and we get our wavelength in meters. Cool? <clears throat> Simple, simple problem so far. So let's go to problem seven. It says an astronomer observes electromagnetic waves emitted by oxygen atoms in a distant galaxy that have a frequency of 5.71 times 10 to the 14 Hertz. In the laboratory on Earth, oxygen atoms emit waves that have a frequency of 5.841 times 10 to the 14. So the one frequency is higher than the other. So we are asked to determine the relative velocity of the galaxy with respect to the astronomer on Earth and the speed of light is given. So we're gonna use this uh, um, formula for calculating the speeds. Um, F observed equals F and square root of one minus beta, where beta is just speed over speed of light. So when we do that, uh, I think I went too far. F over F naught squared is one minus beta over one plus beta. 
and f over f naught is the frequency observed, uh, the frequency divided by the frequency observed on Earth. So the frequency in the planet, uh, the galaxy, I mean, divided by the frequency on Earth squared equals one minus beta, one plus beta. So we get this number when we square that. Then I continue the calculation on the next slide. So one minus beta is this plus this. I put out all the betas. So I solve for beta, I get this number, and this number is equals V over C. C is just the speed of light. So the speed becomes this number times the speed of light C, and that gives us this speed. So they're asking us to find the relative velocity of the galaxy with respect to the astronomer on Earth. So we are assuming Earth to be static and the other one is moving. We are both moving in this, but we have to take it with respect to one. So if we're taking with respect to Earth, then we discover that the, uh, the galaxy is moving away from Earth because the frequency on that galaxy is lesser than the observed frequency on Earth. The frequency on the galaxy is 5.71. The frequency on Earth is 5.8. So if you have a lesser frequency, it means you have a larger wavelength. It means you are moving away. If you are coming towards us, you have a short frequency uh, I mean, you have a, a higher frequency and a short wavelength. It means you are coming towards us. That's how we know the blue shift and the red shift, as we call them. Does that make sense? So this whole procedure is to calculate the speed, explaining if the planet is coming towards or away from you, you have to know with respect to where you are measuring, is the frequency you measured in the planet higher than your frequency on Earth or lower? If the frequency there is higher, then it's coming towards you. If the frequency is lower, it's moving away from you. I don't see that equation on our reference sheet. Um, is it? Possible? Yeah, it's like a Doppler effect equation, like a, when it should okay. be there. Okay, it just looks- Maybe they, maybe they have a different, different the it's written in a different way. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not very familiar with the equation sheet, but at least you have an extra equation you can use in case, an extra tool. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. <clears throat> okay. Next problem. On polarized light with an average intensity 845 Weber per meter squared or watt per meter squared, if you like. Sorry, not Weber. It's just intensity, it's power over area enters a polarizer with a vertical transmission axis. The transmitted light then enters a second polarizer. The light that exits the second polarizer is found to have an average intensity of two to five watts per meter squared. What is the orientation angle of the second polarizer? Okay, so we all know the trick. The, the drill here is very simple. When you pass the first polarizer, you, get, you go into half. That's what happens. Your intensity becomes half. So when you went, the polarizer, the transmitted light, this transmitted light is 845 divided by two. Now, when this transmitted light enters a second polarizer, this 845 divided by two enters a second polarizer, that is when we use the Malus law. It's not gonna times the cosine square of the angle of that second polarizer to the normal equals the new um, uh, intensity you're gonna get out of that second polarizer. And it's, we are giving that to be two to five. So 845 divided by two comes into the second polarizer. What comes out of the second polarizer is 225. And the relationship between what comes out and what comes in the second polarizer is by this Malus law. 845 divided by two cos squared theta equals 225. So now we can get theta. Cos squared theta is 225 times two divided by 845. We get this. Square root of that gives us cosine theta. And cos inverse of this number gives us the angle to be 43.1 degrees. I don't know if I'm making sense here. Good. Thank you, Brinley, for the thumbs up. Rob, we good? Emily, we good? Yeah, we're good. I was just jotting down some notes. Thanks. Okay. All righty. The next one, number nine, five balls label A, B, C, D, and E are placed in front of a plane mirror as shown. Which ball or balls will the observer in the position shown C? So this is just geometry. You're going to draw straight lines. So let's assume the lines go to the edge here the very farthest they can reach. So if I go from B to this edge and reflect at the same angle, I can never cross this guy's eye. C doesn't 
go to this place, it's going to go on this other side when it reflects. So I can't see C at all. I can't see B. E goes to a small angle to this edge and comes back in that small angle. I can't see E. D, the same thing. D goes to this edge and D goes like that, just barely cuts, braces his nose. But let's look at A. A goes to this edge and A goes away that way. So he can see A most likely. And A is the only one it can see because it has a wider angle to get to his eye after reflection. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good. Okay. Number 10, Santa Claus looks at his reflection in his spherical Christmas tree ornament. So it's Christmas tree ornament, those little balls, spherical things. Which one of the following statement concerning Santa's image is true? So first of all, Santa's head is bigger than that ornament. So you can easily guess that the image must be smaller than Santa for sure. <laughs> because Santa is bigger than the ornament itself. Okay, so image must be real. That's not true because Santa is uh, so. Um, this image is going to be a virtual image. It's going to be like uh, behind the mirror, of course, because Santa is going to see himself inside the mirror. The image is farther from the ornament than Santa is. Uh, no, not necessarily. Depends on where the person is. And then the image is uh, is larger than Santa. Nope. The image must be inverted. Nope. So it's not a must that the image will be. So the image must be smaller as the only thing that is correct in this case. And if you look at, I think one of my uh, recitations, I was able to describe to you guys the different images formed in different positions in a spherical mirror. So that can help a lot understand this concept of image formation. <clears throat> Number 11, an object is placed in front of a concave spherical mirror as shown below. The three rays, one, two, three, leave the top of the object and after reflection converge at a point on the top of the image. So we can easily construct these. There are two ways we can do this. So if you extend this line one to the mirror and come back through F, line two through F, hit the mirror and come back on a straight line, and line three straight to C, they are going to all three intersect somewhere here between C and F, and that's where the top of the image will be. So the image will be inverted and will be between C and F. And that image will be smaller than the object because all the lines are going to meet somewhere here and will make this line shorter. <clears throat> so if you know your <clears throat> image formation, you already know when an object is beyond C on this side, image must be formed between F and C to be real in front of the mirror, inverted and diminished. Or if you don't know that, you can just draw the lines, draw this straight to the mirror, pass through F, this straight through F and back uh, straight, and this straight through C, all three we meet in between here, forming a smaller image. So real image means it's in front of the mirror, inverted means it's upside down, and reduced means the image is smaller than the object height. Does that make sense? Good. <clears throat> All righty. If you are taking notes and want me to slow down, please let me know. I can easily hold on for you guys to catch up. No, we're good. Thanks. Okay. Number 12, a concave mirror in an amusement park has a radius of coverture of 4.0 meters. A child stands in front of the mirror so that she appears three times smaller or three times taller, sorry, than her actual height. If the image is upright, how far is she standing from the mirror? So this is the mirror formula, the mirror equation, one over the focal length equals one over object distance plus one over image distance. And magnification is image height over object height, which is given to be three because the image is three times as tall as the object. And that is equals negative image distance over object distance. So magnification has two formulas in terms of the height and in terms of the image and object distance. So in terms of the image and object distance, magnification is three. So our image distance is negative three times object distance. I'll put that in this mirror equation. One over F equals one over object distance plus one over image distance becomes 
one over object distance minus one over three times image distance because of this minus here. Then this is two, when you do this math, it becomes two over three times object distance. So object distance becomes two times focal length over three. Focal length is the radius of coverture divided by two. So don't, your focal length is different from a radius of coverture. <clears throat> Your radius of coverture divided by two is your focal length. So if you come up here from C to the mirror is your radius of coverture, from F to the mirror is your focal length. And from F to the mirror is half from C to the mirror. So the distance from F to the mirror is your focal length. F as a point is called the principal focus. The point is not the focal length, it's the distance that's the focal length. C is called the center of coverture, it's a point, but the distance from the center of coverture to the mirror is what we call the radius of coverture which is two times the focal length. So we are giving the radius of coverture to be four. So our focal length becomes half of four. So I put that here, <clears throat> two times two over three becomes 1.33 meters. That becomes the object distance. And this makes sense because for you to have an upright image in a concave mirror, you have to have a virtual image. I mean, a, a, a real image formed in front of the mirror. And for you to have a real image formed in front of the mirror, you have to be between the focal length or the principal focus and the mirror. So if the focal length is two and you are standing 1.3 meters, you are between the focal point and the mirror. So you're gonna have a real image that is upright for sure. So it makes sense. <clears throat> That's the only time a concave mirror forms a real image is when you stand between the focal length and the mirror. Any other times it forms a virtual image. Uh, uh, Oh, I'm, I think I'm saying it the other way. It forms a virtual image that is upright when you are standing between the mirror and the focal point, and it forms a real image every other time. That's the correct way to say it. Sorry, I was saying it the opposite way. Okay, somebody is asking, how did I get two over three D naught? So from here, you take the LCM, one over D naught minus one over three D naught, the LCM is three D naught, D naught into three D naught is three D naught. So three times one is three, three minus one is two. So you have two over three D naught when you solve this guy here. I don't know if that makes sense. It's, it's a common thing we do, we call LCMs. So what is common between D naught and three D naught is three D naught. D naught, three D naught divided by D is three, three times one is three. So I'll do it here. So this becomes three minus one. Over three D naught. That's how we get two over three D naught. Does that make sense now? Okay. Okay, next problem. It says uh, an object problem 13, an object is placed 20 centimeters in front of a concave spherical mirror that has a radius of coverture. This, which one of the following phrases best describes the image? So first of all, let's find what the image looks like. So one over focal length is one over D naught plus one over D image, which is two over R is one over focal length because focal length is R over two. So two over 60, two over the risk of coverture equals, you could just do one over 30 is the same thing as two over 60. If you divide this by two and put it here, equals one over 20, one over the object distance plus one over the image distance. So from here, we can get the image distance to be two over 60 minus one over 20 to be one over image distance. We'll do that LCM again. LCM here is 60. 16 to 60 is one. One times two is two. Minus 20 to 60 is three. Three times one is three. So we'll get negative one over 60. So we'll get a negative image distance. So a negative image distance tell you it's a virtual image. Okay, so the image is virtual and located 60 centimeters from the mirror. That's behind the mirror. So the image distance is 60, but with negative, so it's behind the mirror. So it knows that negative just tells you it's a virtual image, basically. So if, if we found the image distance to be positive, it would have been a real image instead of virtual. So that will help you know how to you know, describe your image. 
Does that make sense? Okay. Yep. Good. Next, uh, a grizzly bear is sitting on a rock in the middle of a calm river when she observes a fish directly below. If the apparent depth of the fish is this, what is the actual depth given the index of refraction of water? So index of refraction is real depth over apparent depth. That's one equation. So this is really straightforward. So real depth is index of refraction times apparent depth. So it's just 0 0.4 times 1.33, and you just get your answer for your real depth. As easy as that. Number 15, light is incident at the Brewster angle on a plastic plate in the air. The angle of refraction is this, that's theta two, determine the Brewster angle. So theta Brewster plus the reflect refracting angle theta two equals 90 degrees is an equation we can derive and you can find in your text the derivation. So from here, you can just get the Brewster angle to be 90 degrees minus the angle of refraction, 90 minus 35, that just gives you 55 degrees immediately. Number 16 says an object is placed 6.5 centimeters from a thin converging lens with a focal length of that. Which one of the following statement is true concerning the image? Again, let's get the image distance. One of our focal length equals one of our object distance plus one of our image distance. So one of our image distance is one of our focal length minus one over 6.5. We do the same thing. This times that is 91. 14 into 91 is 6.5. 6.5 times one is 6.5. 6.5 into 91 is 14 minus 14 times one is minus 14. So we do that here. We get this, then image distance is the inverse of this because this one of our image distance, it becomes 91 over 7.5 with a negative sign. So we get a negative image distance. So this is a virtual image too. Virtual image located 12 centimeters from the lens. So lens and mirrors are the same. A converging lens behaves as a con concave mirror and a diverging lens behaves as a convex mirror. And the funny thing is a converging lens that behaves as a concave mirror is called a convex lens. And a diverging lens that behaves as a convex mirror is called a concave lens. <laughs> so you have to be careful with the names and which matches what mirror matches what lens. Okay. <clears throat> Number 17, when an object is placed 15 centimeter from a lens, a virtual image is formed. Which one of the following conclusions is incorrect? The lens may be concave or convex, of course, because they could both form virtual images depending on the position. So a, a, a concave lens always forms a virtual image, always. But a convex lens always forms a real image except at one position, when you are between the focal point and the lens. That is when you form a virtual image. So they can both form virtual images. If the image is upright, the lens must be a diverging lens. Nope. Because a converging lens can also form an upright image, depending on where you place the object, if it's between the focal point and the lens. So this is incorrect. So B becomes the answer that's incorrect. Every other thing must be correct. And the last problem, 18, says uh, in a slide projector, the slide is illuminated and light passing through the slide then passes through a converging lens of focal length 0 0.1 meters. If a screen is placed five meters from the lens, so that's the object distance, and you are given the focal length, how far is the slide from the lens? So you're asked to find the object distance. So you are given the image distance and the focal length. So one of our focal length is one of our object distance plus one of our image distance. We are given focal length to be 0 0.1. We are given image distance from the lens to the screen to be five. <clears throat> so we are looking for object distance. So we solve again. We'll get our object distance to be 0 0.1 meters straightforward. And this is the end of the problems we have. Any questions so far? Is everything clear and straightforward and easy as usual? It helps clarify a lot. Thank you. Okay. Brinley, Ryan, we good? I just got here. So, yes. For the one problem I was here for. Oh, it's okay. So I'm going to post this in the next like five, 10 minutes on Canva so you can watch the whole video. Okay. And everyone Thank else you. can. Okay. <clears throat> so watch out for it. I'll just post it on an announcement and probably attach it to the exam also. <clears throat> but I'll be sending an announcement with the link to this once I upload it on YouTube. So watch out for it immediately to show up so you can go through what we did from the beginning. Okay. Thank you. 
You're welcome. You guys have a good one. Thanks for your help. All right. <clears throat>